Thank you. I think there was a, some great questions. I, I, you know, I know that you didn't want to say, I heard you say Caesar judge, but I, didn't, I know you didn't want to say respond to yacht superior. <laughs> right. These Latin legal concepts that we know about, but, you know, respond to superior is, is the master responsible for the, for the servant uh, that you're responsible for your, um, your, your superior is responsible for you. So that's important that we, we chip away at some of these antiquated uh, laws that said that uh, sovereign immunity to protect that state, the Caesar, the king, and all of that, can, the king can do no wrong. Those concepts are flawed. Uh, it, the Supreme Court speaks highly of it in, in um, the U.S. Supreme Court case that protects the military. What is, what is the Ferry's Doctrine, right? Ferry's Doctrine, yes. Yeah. Ferry's Doctrine, even now, that is coming under scrutiny because we need to chip away. Now, if we're not in battle and, and, a, and a commander saying, charge that hill, you can't sue them. <laughs> If you charge a hill and then you get blown up, we're all going to get blown up. That's just the nature of service. But if you get hurt separately from that, you know, the Supreme Court says neither niggardly nor negligently, the U.S. Um, Department of Veterans Affairs is responsible for repairing you in that sense. But, it, you know, unfortunately, that extends to, to uh, women and their children. So if a mother's pregnant in the military, and the child, uh, bad, you know, the, the, the hospital gives bad drugs negligently to that service member and it harms that child, the child can't sue. The child is later born. That child cannot sue the military. And the, mili the United States federal government, to a degree, has waived sovereign immunity, uh, except for when it comes to military. Strictly cannot. So these things, these concepts are important. I know listeners may think, like, what are they talking about? But that's why I think the judiciary is important, uh, Commissioner Lawrence. I think that's why it's critical that if you don't mind to lay people, I'd like for you to expound on why the judiciary is important. And then I want to come to you about creative judges and creative sentences. So, but first, can you explain to us why should we care about voting? We got the president to vote for. We, gotta, we have to decide between two candidates. Um, <laughs> then number, you know, we got the Senate, we got all of this, we got the Congress. Why should we be so concerned about the judiciary? Well, the same way we're concerned about the presidency, we're concerned about the Senate and the House. We ought to be concerned about the judges. And, and to that end, the judges on the federal bench are, are appointed by the president on an advice and consent of the Senate. But, but to that end, the same system is replicated at the state level, at the local level. So we ought to be concerned about that co-equal branch of government, the judiciary, because they have a job to do. If you have a governor and a, and a, and a legislature or assembly or, or whatever it's called, that body, that legislative body is called in your state and they pass laws and the governor enacts those laws. Well, someone has to be there to interpret those laws, to decide whether or not those laws are in violation of that state or the United States Constitution, because laws can be flawed to that extent, because no one's perfect. The legislatures, the legislative bodies are not perfect. They don't do as perfect a job as we would like for them to do in making sure that each and every law is perfectly aligned with the Constitution. And so the judges who are supposed to be those learned individuals who can make that determination are there to do just that. Because if I'm the legislature or a legislative member and my 400, 200 or however many some odd fellow legislators pass a law, we think it's perfect. Otherwise, we wouldn't have passed it. And if I'm the governor and I enact that law, I think that it's worthy of being being uh, enacted upon the people because otherwise I would have vetoed it. So to that end, you have to have that check on the legislature and the executive body in the judges. That's what they're there for. They are the check that we, we, we learn in, in, in eighth, grade, eighth grade civics about checks and balances. Well, they're the check and they're the balance on the, and the executive, on the legislative. So we need them. 100%. Now, I realize that a lot of people, we have, we hear this term thrown around, activist judges, where they're only activists when they make decisions that are directly uh, opposite what your, uh, what your thought process is on that issue. 
judges, in my opinion, I have not seen very many activist judges. I've seen judges who have certain political ideology, certain swaying and leanings, but they, they rule in a manner where they look at the law from some perspective, strict constructualist, or, or 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 black and white. They look at it. Hey, what they said, what the founder said, is what the founder said, and it and it matters. You look at some, and they say, hey, times have changed. They didn't have the internet back then. So when they when they wrote this, they weren't envisioning people with cell phone cameras or the internet or things like that. So so it's all about how those judges look at the law. But they need them. We need them. They are necessary because otherwise, I mean. That's somewhat of, of, a, of a, I won't say a monarchy, but it's, it's, it's definitely not a democracy because there's no check on those other two branches and they are controlling it. Because if they work in concert, then who do we have to say, hey, they're just, they're just passing these laws that are detrimental to me, whoever I am, uh, some, some, some segment of society, to all men, to all women, to all old people, to all blacks, to all whites. It's, 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 it's just not gonna work. You need judges. They are, if Thomas Jefferson, when he was in the in the Congress, he said that the Congress was the most important branch of the government. When he became president, he said that the presidency was the most important branch. Well, me, I say that the judiciary is the most important branch. And uh, it's just par for the course. That's, that's just how we feel when we work in a certain area. You know, I appreciate you explaining that to our, to our listeners and to uh, uh, people that subscribe to uh, to our own defense podcast, the import of um, the judiciary and the power of the judiciary. And, and really, uh, after the police, the branch that you're likely to meet most is the, judici is the judiciary. You know, you, you may go pay your water bill with the city and that's the, technically the, 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 uh, the executive branch or if your light bill is through the city, you may have that through the executive branch. But for the most part, the first time you'll do something, you may get a speeding ticket or citation, and that's gonna come under the realm and the purview of the judiciary. So the judiciary has to have a wide discretion. There's someone who served as a, um, as a, uh, a former commissioner in the 19th Judicial District Court. You have had the chance to see from prisoner suits to all of these cases that have come before you to, uh, you 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 set bells. You've set um, when when you've been the duty judge. When when someone has a, have something quick, a lawyer has something quick, they got to come see the commissioner because you're likely you, you two of the commissioners there would be the ones that'll be the first impact. So that in that first point that uh, whether it's a domestic violence or something like that, you're going to be the one or signing a warrant. Those are those are really important things to have someone uh, like you there at that first step. So the judiciary is extremely important. Um, the, the next question I'd said that I'd like to ask you, uh, Your Honor, would be the the concept. We, we talked about judicial activism, but there's a there's a separate uh, part of that is more about creative. Uh, if there's no mandatory guidelines that are set in place strictly by the legislative branch who makes the laws, who enact the laws, then when you have those um, creative judges like Michael uh, 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 Chicanetti uh, there in Ohio, he's this municipal judge in Painesville Lake uh, County in Ohio, he's known for these creative judges, he's, he's become extremely popular. He won, uh, he won the presidency of the Ameri uh, American Judici uh, Judges Association. Uh, his first creative sentence, which involved uh, a stop school bus, uh, a violation for relating to a stop school bus occurred in 1990s, uh, where famously he offered the 26-year-old housewife, uh, Michelle Murray, the option uh, of spending the night in the woods for abandoning 35 kittens in a forest in the wintertime. He said, you don't do that. You don't uh, leave these poor little animals out. And yes, I want, he wanted to set an example. He's, he's made people listen to classical music. He's done all sorts of creative things. There's even a TV show of Frank Capriati. Uh, there's a YouTube show where it's called, um, um, it's there in Rhode Island called Caught in Providence, Rhode Island. His name is uh, Francesco, uh, Francesco Frank uh, Caprio. Uh, this uh, attorney, politician, and jurist, uh, he serves as the chief municipal judge in Providence, Rhode Island. Everybody loves to watch a little TV show uh, where this judge just talks plain spoken. He's had over 
you know, 100 million views since 2015. Uh, he's just gone viral because it's a folksy charm that he's allowing people, look, you've made a mistake. And people come to him and just say, listen, uh, and he asks them the truth and he, he looks at them. And if he gets a feel that they're speaking hard truths, he gives them simple, lenient uh, uh, sentences because you said something earlier, Judge. You said that if someone is absolute destitute and broke, you think that fine, that $100 penalty you, you put on their lives is you might as well give them 100 years in jail. I mean, it's financially, it's so, uh, so costly to them. $100 to somebody who has zero money is a lot of money. $1,000, it, it, you know, it, it's almost bankruptcy. Uh, and so I've even watched in Mississippi, what well, they have, I, I, I call it chicken jail. If you hold fines in Mississippi, back child support, uh, and I'm sure there's in plenty of states, they can sentence you to go to these, you can sign up, but essentially you get sentenced to these kind of halfway houses where you're in jail. There's one outside of my hometown of Grenada in Lee Floor County, right on the cusp of Grenada County, that people go to jail and then they have to go work at a chicken uh, uh, facility processing plant in the daytime. They have to pay rent and light bills to the jail that they're in that's taken out of their check until they work enough to pay off and reduce the fine or the child support or something like that. The reason I know this is I had a family member that I had to go. I had to go visit them there and it's unconscionable. So, you know, I, I, the, the, the one that is most alarming to me was this kid named Ethan uh, Couch. Uh, and, and for the listeners and, and who aren't familiar with it, Ethan Couch was a 16 year old uh, who was driving under the influence of alcohol and uh, drugs in June 15, 2013 in, uh, in Texas. He was intoxicated, driving with a restricted license, at 16, restricted license, uh, and speeding in a residential area. I looked at the video that they showed the footage of when they did the recreation. It had gutters on both sides of the highway. He lived down the street from these people. These people were standing outside in their own driveway he apparently was, was tanked out. He had been drinking and drugging almost all day. He was living in his parents' house, the old house. They had moved on to the new bigger house and they let him have his own, own house where he could drive. And these are facts that I got from my research. He lived in the house himself and he was drinking and driving and he killed, he killed all these people. He killed four people uh, in a collision, uh, a total of nine people were injured. He had people in the back of the truck. It was just total chaos. Well, his lawyer argued he was, uh, he had a case of affluenza. He was so wealthy, he didn't really understand or appreciate it. So now if you got these folksy judges on one side caught in Providence and the guy in Ohio, and then you got this judge who just let this kid off for some foolishness talking about affluenza, how do we trust the judiciary? What is your take on, shouldn't a judge be allowed some sort of latitude, but not that much latitude? What is your take on those three cases, you know, that I just kind of talked about? Yeah, those, uh, well, the latter is the one that's most alarming uh, because it's, it's so anti what we hear in everyday court systems. We hear people who have issues, who grow up poor, who grow up without, not knowing their mother, not knowing their father, grandma's raising them, grandpa's, grandpa's raising them, doing the best they can. And they haven't had access to a proper educational system. They may have been born of a substance abuse mother, just the list goes on and on. But they get zero to no breaks in terms of saying, hey, I understand that these are the issues that affected you. And therefore, I'm going to do something not to help you out in the sense that I'm just not going to send you to jail, but to actually help you so that you can be a better person. And that's what those folksy judges are trying to do. Hey, I'm going to put you over here and make you spend. I think it's crazy to make someone spend the night out in the woods because they they left some kittens uh, in peril. Um, but it's it's it's. I'm going to teach you a lesson. What lesson did Mr. Couch learn? 
was he taught? As a matter of fact, I, I remember the case because he not only um, was given this affluenza uh, crutch, but he also went to Mexico in violation of, of the judge's orders. Um, and then nothing happened to him after that either. Nothing significant considering he is accused of uh, four counts or guilty of four counts of, of involuntary manslaughter, I think it was. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's so anti what we see in our court system. People who should be given the benefit of the doubt in the sense that who are you and why are you before me in court to that, when you look at it from that perspective, that who are you? I'm a rich kid. And why are you before me? Because I, because my parents failed me in that they didn't teach me. They didn't. That's a fact. They didn't teach him uh, the value of what, what they had earned because it wasn't his. Like, like, like Heathcliff Huxtable said, me and your mother are rich. You have nothing. <laughs> um, if he had been taught that, then maybe he would not have been in that situation. So to do something to give him an understanding that, hey, your parents are rich, you have nothing, and you're here by yourself, you are here to answer for your crime, not your parents. Um, because they gave his parents the benefit of the doubt there, because they're the ones that have the money. He doesn't. He doesn't have a dime to his name. He's 16. So, but but these kids, these 16, 17, 18 year olds who come into the courts across America that are from humble beginnings, they don't get that benefit. And, and, and I'm not saying that they should get uh, an opportunity yeah. to just escape punishment, but I mean, come on. I mean, reasonable people, we learn about reasonable people standards, the reasonable person standard. When we talk about all these legal concepts, the reasonable person standard would say, the person who who was who was given the shorter stick in life should be the one who gets the benefit of the doubt. The person who was given everything should be held to the standard that it's like, dude, you were given everything, and yet and still you go out and you violate law after law after law. So, um, I don't know that young man. I, I don't know. I mean. Who knows, you or I, if we were to have been the judge, we may have given him the same benefit, but not for the same reason. So, so sometimes there's more than one way to skin a cat. I think it's the problem. The problem is that they called it affluenza and they said that because of his rich uh, upbringing and the fact that he had so much money, that that's the reason why he didn't learn how to behave. Uh, that is things that you can't say in a public forum, that's what that is. And I, I believe that, you know, and, and, and the you know, fundamental purpose of in our own defense is, is that this community of African-Americans have, we, we've had a pretty trying time in this 400 year, 400 plus year experiment uh, in the American system. And so it just concerns me when I just see some of my former clients or some of my clients and getting uh, that benefit of the doubt it's challenging and, and it's 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 downright un unacceptable uh and i'm practicing juvenile court where i've helped kids and, and and helped try to right their ship and and give them an opportunity i served as the uh the chair of the uh greater baton rouge team court board um and 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 watching those those youth go through some of their their trying trying times they were not given that that benefited it out, not once. Uh, and now you're right, but they were given other creative ways to, uh, it's about restoration, you know, the restorative impact of putting youth back into a position had they not been. Because, you know, some, we, we need to toe the line on who gave him the drugs? Who supported this? His mind hadn't fully developed, but that doesn't excuse some of the things he did. Like you said, he went to, he went, uh, him and his mother uh, escaped to Mexico, him and his mother. And then when he came back and went to jail and after he got out, he ended up going, he's back, like he went back to jail again. So uh, there's there's deeper issues there. And that's why we need judges to have a deeper impact. One, and that's what brings me to the, to, to the question before Dr. Tarver goes to our next question is, in Baton Rouge, I'm, I'm totally disappointed that in the 19th Judicial District Court, um, you know, one of the largest courts in the state of Louisiana, we don't have the room to have a veterans court. We have a drug court, but we don't have a veterans court. There's 23,000 veterans in East Baton Rouge Parish. And, and I just find it hard to believe that, that the, you know, that 
the, the capital city does not have a veterans court. If you look one state over in Texas, Texas has numerous veterans court. You're a veteran. There's so there's a few more veterans on the bench. And I don't understand how we don't have a veterans court. Veterans are a specific individual who have experienced life in a unique and specific set of circumstances. And I believe that we need to have a veterans court. Uh, what are you what are your thoughts on that? Uh, upon election, uh, there will be a veterans court in the 19th JDC. Uh, no, I, I agree. I, I, when I was uh, the commissioner, uh, one of the first things that I asked, and I, I forget, I, well, I do remember who I asked. I asked uh, um, Judge White, Judge Trudy White, who was running the reentry court, which she brought to the 19th JDC about kind of once she got everything rolling, sponsoring a veterans court. And I told her as the commissioner, I will be the one to help her and sit in on the, on the, uh, the court settings. Um, she wasn't able to do it because she was, the, the reentry court was, it was such a monumental tasking for her and she did a great job with it, but um, it didn't come to fruition. But yeah, upon an election, I, I, I will be, I will be, initiating the proceedings to get a veterans court there. It's a 100% necessity. I think that as we've been talking about, those individuals who, who experience things that others don't experience, mental illness, uh, substance abuse, um, all of those things come full circle and, and affect veterans. Um, PTSD, that is, uh, that's an emotional, disease, if you will. I, I call it a disease, it's not a disease, an emotional ailment. Uh, we have more soldiers and sailors and airmen, Marines and Coasties that have PTSD than we know. They have been diagnosed because as you know, the macho culture of the military tells us, even though they've, they've done such a great job of trying to get us to, to we talked about this on our last, on your last show that, that I was on, try to get us to, to go out and, and seek the treatment. A lot of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, they don't, they don't, they don't do it because they're afraid that it's going to, in, in, it's going to impugn their career. It's going to, it's going to be detrimental to their career, especially those who are in the combat arms. If I'm a, if I'm an infantry soldier and I'm telling you I got PTSD or, or what, what used to be called battle fatigue, I, I'm no, I'm not doing that because I won't be able to go and serve with the elite, you name it, 101, third ID, 82nd, 18th Airborne Court. I won't be able to go serve with them because I I have this this marker that says that I'm not fit to go serve with them. So they don't they don't seek the treatment, and um, so then when they 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 separate, that's still affecting them. On top of life in general because it's like the straw that broke this camel's back when they get home and they can't find a job that's worthy of their their credentials so they're not able to pay their bills or, or what you just name it and then all of this stuff comes crashing down on them and they find themselves on the other side of the law and they're the ones who went and said hey i'm gonna put my life on the line i will i will take death in order to secure and and keep this system that we have which is this, what do you call it? This, this, uh, this, uh, what do they call it? This experiment in democracy, the United States. I, I will, I will die for that. And then they come back and they're, they're broken and they find themselves on the other side of the law. And then our, pro our police officers, our prosecutors, they're not equipped to understand what's going on with this person because all they see is what they would deem a criminal. It's like, no, you, you, what you have here is you have a hero who has issues and we need to help fix him or her, not throw him or her in jail. That's, that's, that's just the wrong answer. So yes, we need veterans courts in order to ensure that we identify these individuals. And once we identify them, we can put them in a position where they get what they should have gotten when they were in, before they separated. Because I spoke with some, some, some counselors with the uh, veterans court in New Orleans uh, with a, uh, Judge Willard. It was Judge Hunters, but upon his retirement, Judge Ben Willard, and you know Judge Willard, Judge Willard took over. And um, the counselors and, and, the, and the employee, they, they, they're just excited because there's another program. It's called the Veterans Mentorship Program. And what it does is it allows individuals who are veterans who didn't get the opportunity to do a veterans court or maybe just didn't survive a veterans court or they ended up in prison. So they're incarcerated in the Department of Corrections. 
Well, it's a program where if they meet certain criteria, they're in a position to be mentors to the individuals going through the various veterans court. And they, once they do that, they do a, a minimum of three year commitment doing that, they can get early parole. So it's, it's restorative in the sense that they've gone to prison, they've met a criteria, and now they're, uh, they're being uh, mentors to the individuals coming through the veterans court and upon completing their tenure, they get an opportunity to get early parole. And as long as you're not in there on a homicide case or certain sex offense cases, you qualify for the program. I mean, you can't, I mean, I can't say you won't, you can't beat that with a stick because some of them may should not be in prison, but they find themselves in prison and there's a there's a way out earlier for them. And it helps the veterans court as well. So instead of just your individuals that you have employed in the Veterans Court, because that costs money, and Louisiana ain't the richest state in the union. So now you have individuals who are going to help you in making sure that your veterans in Veterans Court stay on the straight and narrow, understand what the responsibilities are, understand what the criteria is in order to make it. Uh, you, I mean, you, short of doing the right thing on the front end, Doing it on the back end, I think that this this works. And in addition to that, you have the individuals from the VA who came to because I went to a meeting at Angola uh, on this very program, and the members from the Veterans Affairs, I mean, they are they are ready to help these men out, these men and women get into the mentorship program in order to help the men and women who are in the Veterans Court program. So it's a full circle helping veterans program, and I'm I'm upon election to the court there will be a veterans court in the 19th JDC. Good, Bill, because, uh, uh, of course, Vice Chancellor Donald North, uh, he and, uh, and, and Justin, uh -huh. and, uh, the Colonel, we, we argue about this all the time. Like, come on, Tony, you come do it. Winners, you come over here and do it. And I'm like, so just to let you know, Judge, if you need a uh, judicial administrator or a director of that court, you got the guy uh, right here. I'll be happy to help you guys or at least, you know, help stand it up and we can train someone to, you know, to take over as the founder of VeteransDefender.com. I wholeheartedly support us coming up with systemic ways to, to do that.